morning, everyone. We're going to start today with our modeling and health updates and pick up where we left off on Tuesday and talk about our long-term care facility visiting guidance. So with that, but first, uh, we'll go with Commissioner Pichak. Thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll have our uh, weekly briefing, as always, um, by uh, starting with an overview of some of the trends on the national scene uh, and the national data, turning then to our uh, regional data uh, closer to home here in, in the Northeast, uh, some updates on Vermont-specific uh, items, and then, uh, as always, update uh, our travel map. Uh, again, for those who are watching at home, please feel free to follow along by finding our presentation at dfr.vermont.gov. So starting with our national data and the trends that we're seeing, there is some good news on the national front. Cases do continue to slope down from their peak about uh, four or five weeks ago. Uh, we now see cases are averaging on a daily basis somewhere between 40 and 50,000, still a significant number of cases, but uh, that is down from uh, trends that were closer to 50 to 60,000 uh, just a few uh, weeks. Uh, ago. And again, where we stand today uh, is about seven weeks, uh, a low point uh, from the last time we saw cases in this range about seven weeks ago. So again, uh, on the national front, cases are definitely trending uh, in the right direction, but still rather high uh, with about 40 to 50,000 new cases on a daily basis. When we turn to the regional data, uh, we certainly see that that drive and that decrease in cases is driven by uh, broad reductions in the south. We see the south has decreased quite substantially from its high of a few weeks ago, uh, while cases in the Midwest, the West, and the Northeast uh, continue to trend pretty steady uh, and considerably lower still than the daily case counts that we're seeing uh, in the southern region of the United States. Turning to uh, the death totals that we're seeing across the country, again, uh, these unfortunately continue to be pretty stubborn and stay relatively high. Uh, death, of course, as we've discussed, is a lagging indicator. Uh, but we have seen some uh, slight decline in the number of deaths that we have seen recently. And just this morning, the CDC again uh, predicted that we will see uh, a dramatic decrease in deaths over the next three weeks. At least that is their hope and everyone's hope uh, as uh, we see cases continue to decline. And hopefully, deaths will follow that decline as well. Turning now to our regional data, uh, we can see here in the Northeast that news continues to be good. Uh, a week over week comparison, our cases are down just under 10%, uh, which is a really uh, good reduction. Uh, this is the first time our cases have been uh, at about just over 8,000 cases for the week since early July. Uh, so again, a, a nice um, continued uh, trend downward. We see that this is the third uh, straight week of cases uh, trending down as well. Uh, cases are primarily um, decreasing in places like Quebec, uh, in places like Massachusetts, and they're remaining relatively steady uh, in places like Rhode Island uh, and Connecticut. And I think we mentioned this last week out of the Northeast, uh, Rhode Island is the only state that we're paying particular attention to given um, their positivity rates and some of their test results uh, in recent weeks. But otherwise, the region uh, is performing quite well, and the trends, again, are continuing to look good. Turning to the Vermont data, uh, this week, we reported uh, 61 new cases. That's up uh, from 39 cases last week. Um, but I want to, again, point out that we did have a considerable influx of uh, college students start to arrive. And when you look at our testing numbers, um, the tests conducted uh, in the last seven days were the greatest number of tests that we've conducted since the start of the pandemic. So a pretty dramatic increase in testing uh, you know, coincides with that increase in cases. Um, and that still means that Vermont, as of today, has the lowest positivity rate uh, in the country. Uh, we continue to have the lowest per capita cases uh, in uh, the country from the start of the pandemic. Uh, and we also have the lowest per capita case count in the last seven days compared to the rest of the country. So even though these numbers are up, um, again, our numbers are quite strong compared nationally. Uh, and we see quite a bit of testing happening this week to help explain that increase. Turning ahead now to our, to our restart metrics, uh, these are the four metrics that we uh, are following closely and update on every week. Uh, we see on the syndromic surveillance that things continue to be rather steady. Uh, that number is, uh, continues to be rather low, well below our guardrail, well below uh, any cause for concern, uh, which is certainly good news as, again, this is an early indicator 
uh, of uh, individuals potentially uh, turned into a positive case. We look again at our uh, growth metric, and again, the growth metric, even though we saw an increase this week, uh, the growth is uh, still rather stable, uh, rather relatively low, and nothing of the sort that would give us a concern uh, that growth uh, and trends were increasing significantly. Turning to our positivity rate, again, we mentioned we're the lowest uh, positivity rate in the country, uh, trending at just below 0 0.5, so a very low positivity rate. Um, so even though, again, even though cases went up, the number of tests conducted this week uh, also went up quite considerably. Looking at our ICU uh, numbers, we see that we continue to trend close to that 30 percent buffer. Uh, we're over it at the moment, but as we've um, indicated in the past, since those other indicators are trending uh, in a favorable direction, uh, it's not something that gives us concern at this time. And in fact, as it relates to COVID, there's only one individual in the hospital statewide, uh, which is uh, very uh, good news uh, generally. Turning now to um, an analysis that we conducted this week, taking a look uh, at our region, uh, basically northern New England, Vermont, New England, uh, and Maine. Uh, we were particularly interested in following up on uh, that rural versus urban uh, divide that we talked about last week and seeing how that's impacting us uh, in northern New England. Similarly, you can see uh, for the most populous counties in each of these three states, uh, whether it's uh, Cumberland, Hillsborough in New Hampshire or Chittenden for Vermont, you can see that there is a, a cluster of cases in those counties when you look uh, both from the entire time of the pandemic and for the last two months. But uh, again, when you take a closer look at Vermont, you do see that that concentration in Chittenden County uh, is lower than our peers, uh, both in Maine uh, and New Hampshire, and is also lower than the percent of the population that lives uh, in Chittenden County. So we do uh, believe that we're continuing to see the same phenomenon that uh, is occurring across the rest of the country, uh, where cases moving to more, ur more rural areas uh, and not necessarily concentrating only in those areas that are most urban. So something that we'll continue to keep an eye on as we go forward, but uh, certainly uh, nothing that gives us a, a pause for concern at the moment. Turning now to uh, our update uh, on the forecasting. Uh, again, I think we talked about last week how the forecasting showed a slight uptick in cases. Uh, and we also uh, indicated that over the next two to three weeks, we're really going to have to watch this closely because we have a lot of college students coming back uh, and a lot of testing occurring. Uh, so this is something we'll continue to watch quite closely. Uh, but we do see a, a continued very slight projection up in new cases uh, over the next three weeks. But again, as I said, this is something we'll watch closely and nothing that gives a cause for concern uh, at the moment. Turning finally to our travel map uh, update, you'll see here that uh, we have seen some improvement across the travel uh, region. Uh, we now have 6.6 uh, 6 million individuals who are eligible to come to Vermont uh, without uh, quarantine uh, travel. That's up from 5.9 million last week, a 700,000 person increase. So that uh, was good to see, certainly. Uh, we also see a few things that stand out in the map, particularly a rural county uh, in upstate Maine that uh, turned to yellow, uh, where they did have an outbreak this week associated with a wedding that didn't follow Maine health guidance protocols. Uh, individuals were inside without masks and it exceeded their capacity limits as well. So again, just a reminder about how um, infectious the virus can be and how it can impact places that are more rural uh, than urban, uh, as we're seeing here in Maine. Across the entire region, you see some you know, mixed improvement and some mixed worsening, um, but a pretty stable map uh, altogether. And certainly, like I said, uh, positive news that uh, another 700,000 individuals can come into Vermont uh, without a quarantine. Uh, which uh, certainly is a continued favorable trend. So with that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Levine. You've seen some of the numbers that Commissioner Pichak just provided. And over the last week, Every day is different in terms of numbers. It can be as low as three, it can be as high as in the low teens. That, for now, is exactly what we expect to see. Among college students, there have been in the range of a dozen cases so far this month. This is expected as new students are arriving and campuses have increased testing efforts. <clears throat> Although household and social transmission has occurred among the students, there's no ongoing transmission on any campus at 
this time. At the K-12 level, we hear and understand the fears expressed by many that with the return of students to school in a couple of weeks, we'll see a spike in cases. But keep in mind, our schools are just a microcosm of our communities, and our communities are doing well. As I've said, and as our epidemiologists and the modeling uh, experts expect, we will see new cases of COVID-19 in our schools, just as we continue to see sporadic cases and clusters and even limited outbreaks in our cities and towns. That is, if we all keep up the basic everyday practices that have led Vermont to this point today of having the lowest prevalence of COVID of all the states. Preventing the spread of virus is what we've all been working for, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Thanks to the sacrifices and the actions of every sector of our state and every person in our state, we are beginning to achieve this. That's why it's imperative that we continue to do all the right things in the two weeks leading up to school opening so that the schools will indeed be safe. That, of course, means mask wearing, physical distancing, frequent hand washing, and staying home and away from others when you're not feeling well. We can't afford to let down our guard now. And think twice about fitting in a family trip or gathering before school starts. Just consider the risks. Most activities carry some risk, and some are riskier than others. Remember that no matter your commitments, if you travel out of state to any county not considered safe, you must quarantine for 14 days or get a test at day seven and wait a few days for results. Yes, the school experience will be different this year, but we're gratified at how educators and administrators have been working and planning together with public health to make sure each student can get a high quality education this school year, no matter what form it takes in each school and school district. These are challenging times for everyone, especially for parents and educators. I know that all want to get back to normal, but as we watch the experience of so many other states and countries around the world, I also know that that day is still in the future. While Vermont is among the states with a low incidence of COVID-19, it wouldn't take that much to lose that distinction. We must continue to take every reasonable precaution to prevent a resurgence of the virus. And while we'll continue to see new cases or clusters or even limited outbreaks in our communities, the public health protocols we've been using over the past many months, testing, contact tracing, interviewing and advising people who have been in close contact with a person who has COVID, they really work and will continue to work to limit the spread of the virus. Now I'd like to turn this over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, pick up on a theme that we started last week. There was a news headline that led some to believe that the Agency of Human Services was suspending visitation or not allowing visitation at long-term care facilities. I do want to set the record straight on that. And this gives us an opportunity, I think, to review just where we are with visitation at long-term uh, facilities. Uh, as I mentioned at the last uh, press conference, we have set in motion an easing of restrictions related to visitation at long-term care facilities tied to the prevalence of the virus in the actual long-term care facility and the community at large and associated with testing. However, we are being vigilant uh, and careful as we ease these restrictions. As you all know, throughout this pandemic, Vermonters have sacrificed many aspects of their everyday life in order to keep us all safe. Older Vermonters and their loved ones have been especially impacted. Visitation was suspended in mid-March and allowed to restart on June 19th. Beginning on June 19th, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living and the Vermont Department of Health implemented new guidance that allowed for visitation up to two visitors as long as it was outdoors 
and socially distanced, and face coverings were worn. Starting July 14th, Dale and the Health Department, along with key stakeholders, announced a plan for phase reopening of Vermont's long-term care facilities. In addition to testing standards that are in place, there are other indicators that allow for the movement between phases. There's the, 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 the first phase is, well, phase zero is characterized by there being an outbreak or cases in the facility. That means no visits, no group activities or dining, and no outings except when medically necessary. Most facilities are at the phase one level, which is allowed when a facility has gone 14 days with no new cases and there is no substantial community spread, as Dr. Levine has just man mentioned, and as Commissioner uh, Pichek has also mentioned, this allows for outdoor visits for up to two visitors as long as mass and distance is maintained. Phase two can happen when a facility has seen 28 days and no new cases and there is no substantial community spread. Visitors can be outside and increase up to four non-essential health care and contractors are allowed as well as non-medical necessary medical visits. Some, some communal dining and group activities are also allowed. Phase three, three occurs at 42 days with no new cases and no community spread. At this phase, indoor visitors are allowed as well as all of the things that I just talked about in phase two, as long as uh, distancing and masks are adhered to. Because of the hard work of all Vermonters to wear a mask, socially distance, wash their hands, and stay home when they're sick, we've all seen success in keeping the number of new COVID-19 cases low, and the positivity rates regularly the lowest in the nation. As Commissioner Pichek and Dr. Levine had talked about, we are the lowest in the nation in terms of positivity rates. In addition, these precautions have helped move long-term uh, care facilities through the various phases. As of August 20th, we have three nursing home facilities in phase three as well as six assisted living residents and 10 residential care homes, all in phase three. But we know that even in phase three, social distancing and masks complicate much needed and wanted reunions and visits between family members and other important people in their lives. Admittedly, the deaths that have occurred across the country in long-term care facilities and even some facilities here in Vermont, fortunately to a much lesser degree than other parts of the country, have had a profound effect and impact, certainly on me. As you are all aware, once the virus enters a long-term care facility, it can spread quickly and have devastating results. At the height of the pandemic, I and others had many sleepless nights but for me, many of those nights awake were about making sure we were doing everything possible to protect our seniors who are the most vulnerable to this virus, especially in congregate settings like nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. The frightening part is that cases can ultimately severely, mortally impact literally hundreds of people depending on the size of the facility. It is almost impossible to sleep with that on your mind. Through hard work by many, especially those caregivers at these facilities, and with the proper procedures quickly put in place, Vermont has seen only two major outbreaks in long-term care facilities out of the hundreds existing in this state. Over half of our deaths from coronavirus occurred in long-term care settings. And although we are lessening visitation restrictions, we are also cognizant that the virus is still with us and people in long-term care facilities are vulnerable. Just look across the lake to Lake Champlain. 
across the lake, uh, lake Champlain to New York, where we've had three deaths recently associated with a long-term care, care facility in Elizabethtown, and 26 people at the facility have tested positive. As many of you know, we are doing an aggressive testing, facility-wide testing uh, program in our nursing homes throughout the state. And this morning, it was reported that two long-term care facilities reported two positives um, just this morning through that facility-wide testing program that we're doing. We're seeking confirmation on those results as I speak right now. With all decisions around what is allowed, we need to think about the risks and whether they outweigh the benefits in any decision that we make. This is especially true when we're talking about vulnerable populations who will have poor outcomes if they contract the virus. There's a cost associated with risky behavior. COVID-19 and this pandemic has upset all aspects of our life. In those conditions, it is almost harder to see your loved ones and not be able to give them a hug or even a handshake or interact with them in ways that you used to do. For those who have reached out and expressed the profound impact and challenge this has had on your life and interactions with your loved ones, know that we are hearing you. The health department is looking into if it's possible to make small changes to these regulations to have it feel more like what we're used to with just a small amount of contact while still keeping facilities and families healthy. At the same time, our focus will continue to be on safety, especially when we are talking about the most vulnerable. But being careful, being compassionate, being vigilant is what we are striving to do for caring for our seniors. I'll now turn it over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, switching gears a bit, uh, I'd like to talk about the latest economic recovery proposal we made to the legislature. As you remember, our congressional delegation, led by Senator Leahy on the Appropriations Committee, secured $1.25 billion in federal relief funding for Vermont to help us navigate this pandemic. And I want to thank them for their efforts, ongoing efforts, because it's literally been life-saving for our state. At that point, nearly all non-essential business was at a standstill, so we could keep the virus from spreading, preserve hospital capacity, increase our testing program, and build out our tracing system. And while it disrupted our lives in a major way, our quick approach worked, and we avoided the tragic situations that have occurred in other states and gave us time to develop a strategy that allows us to find and contain the virus when it surfaces. Vermonters' willingness to stay home, stay safe, allowed us to transition to a work smart, stay safe approach as we carefully reopen all sectors of the economy. However, our successes have come at a huge economic cost for families, communities, and businesses, not to mention nearly $300 million in lost revenue needed for government services. But more simply, our economic engine isn't performing at its full capacity. To be honest, it's primarily because of our stay safe policies, but also because people are more cautious about where and when they travel. Fewer people are visiting Vermont, staying in our hotels, eating in our restaurants, and fewer people are buying goods and services from Vermont businesses. Not to mention the border uh, to our north, the Canadian border being closed. We had to back off the throttle on our economic engine in order to slow the spread of the virus. So now we need to focus like a laser on helping these businesses and the jobs they provide survive. So they can thrive in the future as Vermont and the rest of the country work our way out of this pandemic. The way I see it, 
the two most important things we can do as we respond to this virus is first, make sure we find and contain it whenever there is an outbreak. And second, reduce the short and long-term economic impacts. The reality is we don't have the luxury of waiting until we have a vaccine because employers are making decisions right now about whether to fight to stay open or shutter their doors for good. As a result, it's also left employees wondering what they're going to do. In fact, we have over 40,000 of them on unemployment in that predicament right now. That's why last spring we proposed using roughly 400 million of the 1.25 billion in federal funding to support employers and jobs. As I said then, we knew it would be enough. That's how vicious this virus has been to our economy. We appreciate the legislature working with us on the 240 million economic recovery package they approved in June. However, due to the constraints of the programs and the significant need, we've had to turn some applicants away. But now there's an opportunity and a need to continue this work. The legislature held back about 200 million in this funding with the hope Congress might change the rules to give us more flexibility in how it's spent. However, as you may have heard, that flexibility from Washington has yet to come. And as the rules are currently written, we'll lose the funding if we don't spend it before the end of the year. Additionally, my administration presented a budget this week that's balanced, does not cut essential services, does not use our reserves, and most importantly, does not raise new taxes on Vermonters. So based on what we know today, and the immediate need we know exists, I'm proposing to use an additional 133 million of the CARES funding to help save businesses and jobs and continue our economic recovery efforts. Secretary Curley is going to go into more detail in a moment, but before I turn it over to her, I just wanna make a couple of points, or reiterate a couple of points. First, we don't need, nor are we allowed, to use the remaining CARES funding to backfill the state budget. And secondly, Vermont employers, the ones who are the engine of our entire economy, will not rebound on their own while we continue to respond to this pandemic. So we need to continue to help them and the jobs they provide to survive. What we've done thus far has helped a lot, but it's not enough, and we need to do more. So we need to use the money we have left to make additional investments for economic recovery. It's the most important issue for all of us collectively to focus on right now. With that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Curley, who's going to join us by video. Secretary Curley. Good morning and thank you, Governor. As the Governor said, we have made great progress in supporting Vermonters and Vermont business since the legislature went on break in late June. Along with our friends at the Department of Taxes, we stood up and launched an economic recovery grant program in a matter of days, delivering much needed financial support to businesses navigating lost revenues during this public health crisis. To date, more than $100 million has been awarded to more than 3,500 businesses in 22 different sectors and in all 14 counties in Vermont. We have tried to be as nimble and flexible as possible in executing these economic recovery grants within the parameters of the legislation that was passed. This week, we expanded the grants to include more businesses and raised the maximum grant award for those businesses from $50,000 to $150,000. We did this in real time to address the needs we were hearing from those on the ground and in the communities all across the state. We were able to expand the program without making changes to legislation, but we've heard from businesses, legislators, and community organizations that there remain unintentional gaps and some businesses have not been able to access the financial support they need. And unfortunately, the virus has persisted since the legislature was last in session and mitigation efforts to keep it at bay have remained in place. 
Vermonters continue to see their businesses struggle, and there is so much work left to do as we continue to punch back at the economic threat this virus poses and its lingering effects on our local communities. So we are taking what we've learned and, and what we've heard in this last couple of months, and today we're proposing, as the governor mentioned, $133 million of investments in economic development and business support in four key areas. First, $23 million in additional funding for economic recovery grants to help fill, fill gaps in the original program. This includes expanding funding to sole proprietors and partnerships, certain types of nonprofits, very new businesses, and those businesses with less than 50% losses sustained over a three month period. Of the revenue loss figures we have seen so far, the lodging sector is down 97% and food and services down 87% from previous years. These hard hit sectors need more support. So we're proposing $50 million in hospitality and tourism specific grants to bring economic relief and fund recovery solutions as fall and winter approach and capacity and travel restrictions re remain in place. We're also proposing $50 million be used to give every Vermont household $150 as part of a buy local campaign to spur economic activity that supports our local businesses while giving all Vermonters enhanced buying power. And finally, $10 million in economic development and tourism marketing funding that will leverage social earned and owned media to attract visitors from safe regions for the fall foliage and winter season, increase sales of local products and encourage people to consider relocating to Vermont permanently. We look forward to once again working with the legislature to get these priorities passed and bringing continued relief to those that need it just as quickly as possible. Vermonters answered the call to modify their businesses and communities to slow the spread of this virus. We now must ensure they have the tools to survive in the coming months. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Secretary Curley. Uh, with that, we'll open up to questions. Okay, we're going to start in the room as, as always, Calvin. All right, uh, thank you. So, um, Governor, as you said, the last economic stimulus package you pitched the legislature was watered down quite a bit. How are you going to pitch this one to them? Uh, seeing as how there's still three months left in the year, you know, there may be time in Washington. Uh, how, how are you going to convince legislative leadership to pass this? Yeah, you know, it's difficult. This is uh, very fluid for all of us uh, because we don't know what's going to happen in Washington, but we have to deal with reality. And what we're dealing with today is knowing that at the end of the year, if we don't spend the money, we have to turn it back in. It takes a while to put these programs into place as well. We see the immediate need in, uh, in the long-term need of some of our businesses. So we'll, we'll make the case. Um, I think that they'll be sensitive to it. They'll hear from their constituents. It could be a long winter if, uh, if some of these uh, businesses don't uh, receive the relief that they need today. Uh, because again, we have to think beyond the pandemic, beyond uh, just uh, the next month or two. We have to look six months down the road, one year down the road. And the, the businesses are the, are, are the entities that bring us the revenue for our lifeblood in, in government, how we prov provide the services that we do without their Revenue without that revenue source, uh, we're going to be we're going to be challenged in uh, fiscal year 22 as as it is right now. But we'll be even more challenged if we don't have the businesses in place to provide that. So we'll make our case. I'm hoping they'll be sensitive to it. Uh, but as well, we'll watch to see what Washington does. And this could change everything if they gave us more flexibility, gave us a little bit more time, and maybe even more resources. And um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on the new unemployment numbers that came out this morning. Uh, it's down to 8.3%. Um, I'm wondering if you know you expect that to maybe hold steady uh, or like keep going down, or maybe if that's holding steady because we haven't opened up the state. Yeah, it, you know, it's uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, it's good news in some respects because it's uh, it's been reduced by about a percent. Um, but I, I I'm not sure what's going to happen uh, when it gets colder. Uh, when some of these businesses, uh, for instance, the out outside dining uh, that we've opened up uh, may not be available uh, in the winter, obviously. Um, so we're, uh, we're going to be 
uh, continually watching that number. And I would say, even though the percentage is down, you know, to that uh, into the 8% range, uh, which is good news, uh, unemployment is 100% for those 40,000 who are still uh, without jobs. So we have to watch that and be sensitive to that. That's an incredible number uh, for the state. NBC5. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure I understood uh, some of the areas with the new um, grant money coming up, $133 million. Was one of those, uh, it sounded like $150 for each Vermonter, was that right? Is that for local spending, or is it with the hopes that it'll be local spending? Uh, how will that come up? Yeah, I mean, I'll let uh, Secretary Curley answer that in, in, uh, specifically. Uh, but from my standpoint, uh, it's a program that we are trying to develop to make sure uh, that if we uh, provide uh, for this, uh, these dollars uh, for families, that it'll be spent specifically in Vermont and specifically in these areas. So think of it as uh, some sort of a, a card of some sort that could be utilized uh, for some of these, these entities and, and then keep them in business and keep the resources coming in. But I'll let Secretary Curley uh, answer that specifically. Governor, you did a great job with it. Uh, you know, really the, the CRF funds, we're not allowed to, to make cash payments to Vermonters, but we are allowed to provide um, a discount card, as, as the governor uh, referred to, where it would put the buying power into the hands of Vermonters while ensuring that that, that money is invested back into local businesses. So this is a way, so it's a win-win-win for us to get money in the hands of our local businesses and our communities, but um, giving Vermonters the opportunity to choose how they're spending the money. Got it, thank you. Um, and uh, a different question now about, um, like Essex County, New York, I think it was the, the county bordering Vermont that just went to red. Wondering, have you been in touch with folks in New York to see, is that connected to the nursing home over there or the long-term care facility and to see what parameters are around that outbreak um, and, and how much concern is there about spread to Vermont from that? Yeah, obviously any, uh, any border issues that we have, counties that border our state, we're, we're concerned about, uh, specifically with the outbreak in Elizabethtown with the long-term care facility. I'm sure it'll impact us in some ways um, because we'll have to work with them uh, in terms of taking some of the patients and, and so forth into our hospitals. Um, but, uh, but I would ask uh, Commissioner Pichak, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what information was utilized for the travel map. Whenever we do see big um, changes in the county, particularly when they're close to us, we do look into that a little bit more closely. And it is, you know, primarily tied to that outbreak um, in Essex County, New York, uh, that uh, Commissioner or Secretary Smith uh, spoke about earlier. So uh, that is the um, reason for that uh, county uh, turning from green to red so quickly uh, is associated with that outbreak. Thanks. And um, lastly, we received a release uh, about Helen Porter in Middlebury, but it sounded like there was a second facility that had some positive cases. Um, do we know which facility that is? Uh, Secretary Smith. I said there were two uh, that we were aware of this morning. One was the Helen Porter that you just mentioned. The other one is Wake Robin, a unit. Now, I don't want to. I want to be specific on this. Just a single unit. Um, with uh, single rooms in that unit. There has been a positive reported. My understanding is these are facility-wide testing that has been done at both of these facilities uh, in accordance to our testing protocol with long-term care facilities. Um, we may do some retesting on some of these just, just to reconfirm, but uh, the other one is uh, Wake Robin. And uh, with both facilities, what, um, uh, how much information do we have on how contained it is or how much concern there is at the moment about the possibility of uh, expecting any more positive cases to come? Well, we have done facility-wide testing in both of those. I, I don't know if all the results are in yet, but we'll have a good idea. As Dr. Levine has explained uh, many times, and, and so has Dr. Kelso, the EPI teams are all over this right now, uh, making calls, making, uh, uh, trying to find out contact information, and trying to make sure that these are contained uh, as we move forward. Thank you, Paul. Steve Wachamp, Local 22, Local 44. All set. Oh, all set. 
Katie Jacklin, BT Digger. Thank you. Um, what challenges do you see in terms of state capacity to combat the virus going forward? Like, what do you foresee being the limiting factors, whether for testing, medical capacity, contact tracing, or anything else? You know, um, I feel uh, pretty good about uh, our capacity at this point in time. Our uh, PPE inventory is steady. Our, our testing, um, a number of tests available uh, to us has been staying steady. Uh, we continue, uh, I think I was asked this maybe three or four weeks ago, how much testing uh, supplies we had left. Uh, and uh, if we didn't receive any more, we were good for a month or two. And that stayed steady. Uh, so we're still good for another month or two if they all of a sudden magically stopped tomorrow. Uh, but, uh, but I'm seeing, you know, some, some hope on the horizon uh, in terms of different testing uh, available throughout the country that's being utilized that we, we will consider. Um, we want to continue to, to increase our, our testing capacity in any way we can. Contact tracing, if there is an outbreak, is, is a main concern, but uh, again, uh, our EPI team has been uh, has been monitoring that and training uh, people for if there is uh, further need. So we're preparing ourselves, uh, and I think we've done a pretty good job in that respect. But again, this is this is a, a daily struggle. Uh, we watch this uh, every single day uh, to be uh, be sure with all the pop up tests uh, that we have. That strategy going out throughout the state uh, has given us the ability to see uh, outbreaks in certain regions and then uh, be able to immediately uh, get on top of that to uh, contact trace uh, to be sure that we can contain it. So, so far so good. Uh, our numbers are showing it, uh, but, uh, but I feel good about where we are at this point in time. And as part of a, this is a bigger picture question, but how, have you thought about the way that the pandemic will change the way that we conceptualize and approach public health for the long term? Well, I think it has made us all more aware. Um, and, and certainly, uh, you know, we've had uh, numerous uh, flu seasons over the last uh, decade or two. Um, we've had flu vaccines. Uh, we haven't, uh, I don't know uh, what our rate of uh, compliance in terms of the vaccine has been. But I would expect that people are paying more attention. Uh, they can see the ramifications um, using good uh, uh, hygiene, washing our hands a lot. will will benefit not just this uh, pandemic, uh, but uh, the flu seasons in the future. So I think um, in, in many different respects, uh, this changes our behavior, just changes the way we look at things, um, and, uh, and opens up doors with telehealth and so forth that we've had to, we've utilized. I think that the, that future is bright and we'll be utilizing that more. So um, obviously uh, in some respects, it seems like this pandemic started years ago. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just the, uh, the, the way we've had to deal with it on a daily basis. But um, really, it's just been months uh, since it started. So we are going to uh, realize uh, more and more uh, as time goes on and hopefully learn from this uh, so that we can do things uh, in, a, in a more structured, strategic way uh, to prevent this from happening, but also uh, to, to make sure that we're healthier. Okay, we're going to move to the phones now. Anything you want to add? Oh, I can always add Why don't we have Dr. Levine add anything okay. more? Uh, like to add. One second. I'll try not to be verbose now. Uh, so, um, you know, science has taken a hit in recent uh, months, years. Uh, so hopefully one thing that comes out of this is a greater appreciation and respect for science, kind of getting back to the way things once were with our, our regard to science. The other thing is uh, the status of public health in general. I'm not talking one state's effort, but you know, as a nation. Um, the United States has been very different than the rest of the world. Most of the developed nations in the rest of the world routinely attribute or contribute something in the teens percent, 12 percent, 18 percent, depending on where you are. Uh, of their health budget, health care budget, to prevention and public health. The United States has traditionally been in the low single digits in that category. Uh, so one might say you get what you pay for. The problem is not just the current administration, it's been successive administrations over quite a number of years 
that have continually eroded away the amount of money going to prevention and public health. Uh, so I think one of the uh, hopefully um, intended, as opposed to unintended, consequences of surviving a pandemic will be a greater appreciation for all of what I've just said and more investment, not just in emergency responsiveness and pandemic response, which had been really decimated uh, over a couple of administrations, but really the general concept of prevention and public health and its contribution to the population's health uh, in general. So, so many of the initiatives that public health has always talked about uh, traditionally over the years, whether it be, you know, maternal child health oriented discussions like uh, home visiting programs for moms and their newborns, um, after school programs that we've talked about to protect adolescents, um, and then beyond that, more health promotion and chronic disease prevention activities for the general population. I think there'll be a greater appreciation for all of those things in concert with emergency preparedness so that nations are better prepared to uh, face whatever comes next because scientists have been telling us for quite a number of years this should not be a surprise. This was something that was expected at some point in time. Um, I think we'll see a, a greater appreciation for all of that. Okay, moving to the phones, Joseph Gresser, the Barton Chronicle. I think the first question I have is for Dr. Levine. Um, as much as I hate projections, um, I was wondering whether the expectation is that once college students have been back in the state for a while, um, the, their contribution to um, the increase in COVID cases will decline and things will revert to the current background noise or whether you expect uh, there to be a continued uh, rise in the number of cases as long as the schools are in session? No, thanks for that question. That's a great question. So even now, the rise in cases is fairly minuscule when you think about thousands of college students. Now, we do have thousands more still to come in the next week or two. Uh, so we'll see, again, lots of tests done, and hopefully only a small percentage of those tests be positive. But we know by definition that so many students are coming from areas of the map that are to do, not, do not look as green as Vermont on the map, um, so that there's an expectation that they will be bringing some virus with them. But all of the colleges are abiding by quarantine protocols, whether a student has a positive test or a negative test. And so once we get through that initial period, um, the college student population, if you will, should again look like our general community population in Vermont. And we'll have an idea of where we're starting from and watch closely as to where we evolve to. So, I would not think that the college contribution to our number of cases would be any different than any other part of our population, with only one exception, and the exception, of course, and this can apply to anyone in our population, not just the college students, is ability to adhere to all of the general guidelines we give everyone every day. Um, and where you've seen college campuses abruptly shutting down around the country, um, it's often been attributed to the fact that there were too many things going on in the areas of mass gatherings, lack of physical distancing, lack of masking. Um, not to say that it's always the student's fault, but that certainly has been the, the party line that's been given uh, at most of the campuses that have shut down. Uh, so as long as I think uh, students here adhere to the kind of contract they're being asked to sign, and adhere to, if you will, the social contract that all Vermonters have been asked to sign without actually putting their signature on a piece of paper, uh, things should go very well. So we will uh, eagerly watch that, Joe. Um, thank you. I have one other question, and it's on a different topic. I am curious about how things 
states are going and rolling out the um, new $300 supplement to unemployment benefits. Uh, I expect that Vermont's um, contribution to that is relatively simple, but I believe there remain questions about the president's authority to allocate that money, and I'm wondering whether the federal funds are actually moving. Yeah, Joe, uh, we just submitted our application this morning uh, to that. There's been just a handful of states that have uh, successfully uh, been uh, allowed to do this, so we're hoping to be amongst them. Uh, I don't know about the legality. Uh, we'll see. Uh, but, uh, but in the meantime, we're just pushing forward. Uh, and so we put in our application. Uh, obviously, that's for the 300. Um, we, uh, I had also included uh, $20 million in um, in CRF funds uh, to be utilized for this, uh, asking the legislature for approval uh, with the Joint Fiscal Committee. Uh, we'll be, uh, they'll be taking that up uh, soon uh, and, um, and see whether we, we add the $100 on to uh, that benefit. But this is going to take a little time because it's, nothing is simple in, uh, in Washington. Uh, so even when we do uh, get approval, uh, which I expect we will, uh, it could take two to three weeks uh, to actually uh, come to fruition. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this more complicated than it should be, uh, but we're dealing uh, with the situation at hand. And uh, until Congress gets together and just extends the program that we're utilizing right now, this other system is just a little bit more complicated and takes a little bit more work. Uh, so it's going to take a while to set up and get approval for. Thank you very much. WCAX. I have a question for Dr. Levine. I saw that Quidel, the company that made the antigen test that we use in southern Vermont, said that their investigation is the false positive, found no issue with the testing facility or the quality of the product used. So they said they believe all of those were true positives and that the state's follow-up PCR tests were potentially wrong. What is your response to the company's findings, and what did your department's investigation into those antigen test results find? Hey, good morning, Kat. You're correct. Uh, for those who haven't read the Kaidel press release, um, the FDA's investigation didn't find any specific issues with the instruments or how they were used. While we wish we had a more conclusive answer about the whole situation, the health department continues to rely on epidemiological data. And that data does not point to an outbreak of COVID-19 in the Manchester area and additional testing of people in that community's surrounding supported that. And events subsequent to that time have not supported any ongoing community transmission of COVID-19 in spite of ongoing testing. I do think the uh, statement by Kaidel regarding the uh, PCR testing uh, was inappropriate and certainly not supported by data gathering that uh, occurred at the level of their own instruments. We continue to talk with the Centers for Disease Control and follow their guidance on how these instruments should be used. And we continue to talk with Manchester Medical Center to coordinate uh, any subsequent steps. I do want to add that the most commonly used test is the PCR test, and it is known as a reliable test. And I would want people in Vermont to know that if they need to get tested, they should have a high degree of confidence in their results. We also appreciate very much the health teams, the providers, and other partners who came together to ensure that the community could access testing and get results when needed. This should give Vermonters confidence that we can respond quickly and effectively moving forward. I know at one point you said that um, you were pretty confident that the investigation that the health department was doing, um, especially in conjunction with, I believe, the team in Maine that was looking into a similar incident there, was going to find out what happened here. What did that investigation find? Anything? Yeah. So. So far, the investigation that's been announced has been the FDA's, which clearly looked only at the uh, instruments. We're continuing to work with the Centers for Disease Control, so it would be premature for me today to really say any more about the epidemiologic part of the investigation um, until further notice. 
When do you expect that you might be able to kind of shed some light on what happened here? I would think uh, within a week uh, we'll have the results of our discussions with CDC. Um, I would want to caution you that shedding some light uh, might not be the end result. Uh, there may still not be an ability to totally explain the discordance in the epidemiological data and the testing data. I guess the last question I'd be remiss in asking is, should people trust antigen tests? Yeah, I do think that uh, the antigen test has shown itself to be a trustworthy test. We have to be careful to make sure that uh, they're used in the way that the FDA has uh, approved them to be used. And in fact, uh, almost in, uh, too coincidental to be true, uh, five days ago the uh, CDC uh, updated its guidance regarding the use of antigen testing. Um, and was very specific about the appropriate populations and timing and things of that sort. So um, I do want uh, Vermonters to have trust in that testing platform uh, as, it is as it is utilized appropriately. Thank you. Thank you. Courtney Adelman, Local 22, Local 44. Hello, um, my question is also for Dr. Levine. Um, just a question kind of looking down the road with schools and everything opening. I'm um, just wondering how you're feeling about going into flu season and if someone presents flu-like symptoms, how should we know if they need a flu test or a COVID test? It's a great question. It would make you want to be sure that you could test for both in a very quick and rapid fashion. And that test I believe has been developed and maybe having the finishing touches on it. Um, ideally, we'd be able to test for three things. You know, currently we can test for flu and for what's called RSV, which is a respiratory syncytial virus often seen in kids, um, but as well in adults. Um, and we should be able to test for all three, you would hope, at a time when we know all three will be present in the population. So I can't give you a specific date, um, but everyone's eagerly awaiting the opportunity to be able to test for them all concurrently, which will really help. So they are, yeah. so they are working on something that will test for both? Yes. You know, and it will also be interesting, as an aside, to see the impact of the unfortunate physical distancing and masking we all have to abide by, and that all of our school students and college students are also being asked to abide by. It'll be interesting to see the impact of that on the levels of disease of these other kinds of more common diseases that we're accustomed to every fall and winter. Um, because Australia, at least, reported a fairly reduced flu season this year. And obviously, you know, they're opposite to us in their seasons and all of that. Uh, doesn't mean that that necessarily um, implies that we're in for a very easy season here, but we, all, we watch that with interest every year, and often the uh, correlation is pretty good. So perhaps some of their decrease in their season had to do with just these measures that prevent people from spreading germs to one another. Do you hope to have um, more people getting a flu shot? We have a huge amount of campaign to uh, uh, unveil to, to really work on uh, not only encouraging people to get flu shots, but making the flu shot so accessible that they'd have to consciously say, I am not getting a flu shot because, um, not, and not use an excuse, I couldn't get in to get one or I couldn't find one or what have you. Um, the flu shot season will probably be a little earlier than usual, although none of us have received our shipments yet, but uh, people are eagerly awaiting. And at the levels of schools, at the levels of healthcare system, at the levels of pharmacies, uh, everyone is gearing up to try to make sure that access to the flu shot will not be an issue. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Levine, before um, 
move on there, I had that question about Kaidel also. So the discrepancy was about 50 positive cases. And basically, Kaidel was saying um, that they were positive, and uh, the Vermont Department of Health said they, they were not. So uh, are, are you maintaining that they were still false positive? So Kaidel and uh, the FDA is saying that they believe there was no problem with the instrumentation or how they were used. So those tests will be called positive. That doesn't mean that we can call each positive test a confirmed case by our guidelines in Vermont and in many other states where PCR confirmation is required. Um, and it doesn't resolve the epidemiologic discrepancies, but indeed, um, the tests that were positive uh, are positive according to the data that uh, the company and the FDA accumulated. But you're not going to change the Vermont numbers uh, based on that? Well, some of those are included in the Vermont numbers because they did have PCR confirmation. But you're correct. There's yeah, a, okay. there, but there's a large number that did not. Um, and for um, Commissioner Harrington, I think I believe he's on the phone. What, what are the, um, I, there's 40,000 people unemployed, and they, they might be wondering what jobs are available because there are some jobs available. What are, what are you seeing as uh, positions that seem to be begging at the moment? I uh, appreciate that and uh, would also uh, point people to our jobs report that came out uh, for uh, last month, just this morning. Uh, and um, let me just make sure I'm pulling the right information here for you. Um, one second. Uh, I think what we are seeing uh, overall is um, typical uh, upticks in certain industries during this time. Uh, we did see an increase uh, in certain sectors. Uh, so instance for arts, uh, entertainment recreation. Uh, we saw an increase uh, last month of about 300 jobs. We saw additional jobs in local government, uh, and that was up about 1,900. Uh, and uh, in information services, that was up about 200. Um, so I would say overall, we are seeing uh, as restrictions lessen, uh, as uh, businesses are able to resume normal operations, even at reduced capacity, uh, we are seeing people able to go back to work. Um, and certainly uh, as schools uh, reopen in the fall, um, we'll see individuals uh, back to work as well. I think the governor hinted uh, at it earlier in the press conference. You know, we, we recognize that, you know, for the, for the 40,000 or so uh, individuals who are unemployed, they are completely unemployed. And so, uh, you know, it is our priority to ensure that those people uh, have the necessary, uh, necessary resources and benefits they need um, to weather this storm. Um, and certainly as uh, the colder months come in, um, that will impact other industries as well. Um, food service, obviously, but uh, also things like construction. Um, so, you know, we are, we are acutely aware of that and, and recognize um, that this is far from over. Um, but we, we do offer uh, and have been offering uh, online virtual workforce uh, development and labor force services for reemployment. Uh, and I would encourage people to either um, check out our website or contact one of our local regional offices uh, as we're doing uh, mainly online uh, virtual services, career fairs, job fairs, and, and hiring events. Uh, online for individuals looking to um, work. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, uh, Ethan. Uh, I had a couple of questions, but just got an email with an interesting question. So, uh, a reader in Franklin County wants to know why are teachers and support staff not listed as essential workers in the executive order? Uh, obviously, healthcare, emergency responders, banks, news media are listed as essential. But a quick check, I could not find teachers 
whatever. Is this an oversight or are we just missing a notation somewhere? Well, in, in some respects, uh, Mike, we could answer it a couple different ways. But uh, in the beginning, as you know, we closed the school infrastructure, went to remote learning and so forth. Um, they, uh, they have continued uh, to, be, uh, to be paid, uh, all of the teachers and, and some of the support staff, most of the support staff have been uh, continued to be paid. So there hasn't been a gap in that respect. So I'm not sure what would be gained if they were called essential workers or not. And I'm not sure about our designation um, in, in terms of what, um, again, what, what our expectations are. Uh, with essential workers. Okay. Uh, and the other question is, is there some irony that Vermont schools are going to be fully open, but in some communities, the municipal offices are failing to provide some basic in-person regular government services. Uh, I mean, take some of these towns, even the city of Burlington, all the schools are going to be opening with students, teachers, staff, but uh, the mayor is yet to fully open Burlington City Hall. Uh, is the state offering any sort of help to these cities and towns unable to get government doors back open and all services fully running? You know, again, we, we spoke about this uh, a little bit last week when we announced that we wanted uh, state employees uh, to work remotely if possible. Um, we're encouraging all businesses to adhere to that that standard, that policy. Uh, if you can, stay home and, and work from home, uh, if possible, uh, to provide those services. Um, because we want to increase the capacity, we're lessen the risk uh, amongst uh, all uh, of our population. So um, I think that, uh, again, municipalities uh, can uh, obviously do what they need to do, uh, but they have to answer to their constituents as well. Uh, we'll be uh, announcing over the next uh, few days, maybe next week sometime, um, a plan to open up a, some motor vehicle uh, in-person uh, stations uh, so that we can, uh, we can take care of our, our constitu constituents uh, in, a, in a better way um, by, uh, by a, new, a new program uh, that will require a reservation for those in-person uh, uh, negotiations and, and uh, services. So um, we uh, may be able to, once we prove ourselves, may be able to offer some of that, uh, that platform to the municipalities uh, to utilize, or they might learn from us uh, when we move forward with that. But, uh, but again, I think uh, everyone's trying to do the best they can without putting more burden on the system. And if that means they can stay at home and work, uh, we encourage them to do so. Yeah, we continue to hear about DMV as being a major uh, uh, problem where people cannot get in there. Yeah, we'll be uh, uh, we'll, yeah we'll be talking about people. about that next week. Um, there'll be uh, three major Ooh. facilities that will be opening up for some in-person services. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Hi, Governor. Uh, just a quick follow-up on, on what you just said with Mike. Uh, you said maybe three facilities statewide are going to be opening. I know a lot of residents from Franklin County rely on or used to rely on the maybe twice a month uh, DMV in St. Albans. Is that not going to be? Uh, I think the first three, obviously, we want, to, yeah, we want to expand upon this, but uh, we are going to, I, I believe, uh, without getting too far ahead of ourselves, I think I have this right. I think it'll be Montpelier, uh, South Burlington, and Rutland uh, first, and then we'll expand from there. So hopefully we can get uh, all of them open in some capacity uh, with the, you know, proving ourselves in the, uh, in the initial f uh, three uh, to somewhat walk before we run. Okay, uh, I had a follow up for Secretary Smith, but uh, while you're here, Governor, um, I've been hearing at least anecdotal evidence that there's been some issues with Johnson State College students not following the required quarantines. I'm wondering if you can touch on uh, what you know as, as uh, the executive of Vermont uh, as to what's going on with 
students coming back and, and what have you heard as far as uh, students not following quarantine uh, or being punished uh, for doing so? Yeah, I, I haven't heard so. um, I haven't heard about that specifically, um, but um, but that doesn't surprise me in some some ways. I know this is going to be challenging, um, but it's incumbent upon the uh, the universities and colleges themselves uh, to uh, police this, uh, and we've given uh, some flexibility uh, to some of the <clears throat> municipalities. As you heard, uh, Burlington uh, took advantage of this, reduced the size of gatherings both inside and outside as well as limited the the hours of uh, operations of some of the the bars and clubs in burlington um, if johnson for instance sees that there's a problem in the same regard uh, they can do that as well uh, but the college and universities have a responsibility uh, to to make sure that the the guidelines that they proposed uh, are followed and uh, we'll uh, continue to work with them uh, to make sure that happens at least what I've heard in Johnson is that there are students that may have, you know, just shown up from out of state and uh, are, are not quarantined in 14 days, they're going out to restaurants, or are going to get groceries, going to, you know, a local shop. Yeah, kind of thing. again, I haven't, <clears throat> have not heard that. Um, in fact, uh, I believe that the um, VTC students are, are, their policy are much more rigid than even our own. Uh, so. Uh, they've been doing uh, a great job, but I don't. I haven't heard uh, that much about Johnson. Okay, and a uh, quick follow-up for uh, Secretary Smith. Um, you were talking about nursing homes earlier. I'm wondering if uh, you mentioned there were, I think, if I'm remembering right, three nursing homes and what eight uh, rehab centers that are under monitor. Um, can you release? the names of those um, and uh, my other question which I had prepared earlier before you spoke um, we've been hearing that there are some facilities in Franklin County that are not allowing um, residents who are under their 14 day quarantine when they first show up uh, to have any physical correspondence mail uh, newspapers etc um, and, and that's been perceived by some families as, as you know, emotionally abusive. Is that a is that a policy that nursing homes can put in, or is that a policy that the state has uh, asked to have done? The only policy the state has asked for is a quarantine. If you're coming into a nursing home, a quarantine period of 14 days, uh, and then some testing uh, with that. Um, in terms of the restrictions that you just mentioned, those are news to me. Uh, those aren't state guidelines. And I haven't heard of any nursing home that sort of prohibits those sort of, uh, uh, that have imposed those sort of restrictions. I'll certainly look and uh, into the Franklin County area, but I have not heard of those. Uh, your other question, uh, I'm, uh, there's, uh, we aren't monitoring per se nursing homes. What I, what, what I said was, in order to go from phases, you have to do certain things within uh, the nursing homes and w within those phases you um, uh, you are granted to go to a different phase testing is is part of that phase for a nursing home for particular the the time limits to go from phase zero to phase three phase three is basically the 42 days of no cases no community spread at that phase as i had mentioned indoor indoor visitors are allowed as well as things that were in phase two which were considerable, um, and as well as uh, distancing and masks are adhered to. What I mentioned with uh, various groups, I said, um, who's in phase three, which is the top phase that we have, and as of August 20th, uh, three nursing facilities are in phase three, six assisted living residents are in phase three, and 10 residential care homes are in phase three. Which is good. Which is good, by the way. Um, can you make those those homes public so that the, the public knows who's following, you know, or, or who's completely in the phase three or four and who's not? Yeah, I don't see any reason why not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time, uh, Secretary, and thank you for your time, Governor. Guy Page.
Governor, a couple of legislative questions. Yesterday, the House Minority Leader, Patty McCoy, issued a statement opposing the Global Warming Solutions Act because of the lawsuit clause, which you've addressed before, and also the executive policy setting Climate Council. Um, if the Climate Council is in the bill that eventually reaches you, if it does, uh, would you veto it? Well, again, in the letter that we sent uh, to the legislature, we highlighted uh, some of those issues, um, those two being uh, part of uh, the issues that I have with the legislation. So um, we see a path forward. We said that there's certain things that we could do to alleviate those concerns, and uh, we're hopeful uh, that they will take us up on our offer to work together. But, um, but I don't know anything more than that at this point in time. I don't believe we've received anything formally back from them. Okay, thank you. Um, also this week, social justice and farm groups came out against S-54, the tax and regulate marijuana bill, because they say it favors white Chittenden County business owners over rural and minority ownership, among other concerns. Um, are you aware of these concerns? And if the House and Senate do reconcile their versions of the bill, would you veto it? Well, again, you know, I had my own uh, stipulations in terms of moving forward with this, uh, with the tax and regulate system, which I've made, um, I've been vocal about over the last couple of years, and we'll see whether they address those or not. I haven't heard about the others, but I know that there's a lot of controversial items uh, within the tax and regulate system, and there's a lot of points of view. So we'll see what they do uh, in, the, uh, in the next uh, month or however long they're in session. Um, but I would, um, I would expect regardless uh, that this, if it doesn't, pass uh, in September, October, it would be back in January. Sorry, Governor, you're breaking up on my end, but I'll, I'll check the transcript on the, uh, on the, on the uh, Facebook. Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Steve Merrill. Um, hello, can you hear me? You can. Great, thanks. A um, uh, quick one for the doctor and uh, then for the governor, if I may. Um, Dr. Levine, uh, you really uh, piqued my interest when you said that uh, for public health, um, we get what we pay for and it might be wise to allocate more funding for public health. Um, where specifically would you, would you see more public health spending on a state level because uh, a, a quick search of like uh, the CDC mistakes and bungling will net you a long litany of problems at the CDC, which has spent billions and billions of dollars. Is uh, would you like to see more money or uh, resources uh, at the state level, or, or or are you talking federally? So it's obviously a little of both, but <clears throat> clearly at the state level, it's definitely needed. Turns out much of what Congress appropriates to public health goes to the CDC and then it's funneled through various grant mechanisms to the states. Uh, so anytime the CDC budget is at risk, uh, state public health budgets are secondarily at risk. Uh, I do, do want to emphasize when I was talking about uh, the need for more investment as a country in this, um, the commonly used arguments, and these are completely valid, are to look at the health outcomes in the United States, look at the health care expenditures in the United States, and compare both of those to other developed nations, whether they be in Europe, in Asia, anywhere in the world. And you find uh, that the United States, in spite of being the leader in spending, much of that spending being on high technology, uh, but also on, uh, on the uh, people in the healthcare system and on medications. Um, we are the leader in the spending, but our outcomes don't parallel that. And whether you're looking at life expectancy, uh, maternal outcomes in pregnancies, uh, infant mortality, uh, the list goes on and on and on, uh, the United States should be much higher based on what it spends, but is not. And it's because what it is spending on is on health care and not on health. 
So the whole issue is really one of not trading one off for the other, but the proportions need to be readjusted. And a focus on health allows uh, the kind of prevention that doesn't lead to the disease outcomes that then look worse than other parts of the world. Uh, well, okay, what, what would you like to see for Vermont specifically? Uh, say a larger staff, uh, a larger department, uh, uh, better laboratory facilities? Is there something you could tend to? Well, I'll take, I'll take all of those, but uh, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 bottom, the bottom line is again, the kind of attention to the problems that are public health and health problems uh, that a state can then deal with. So um, obviously my earlier comments were true that the investment as a nation in public health has ratcheted down over many, many, many years. So indeed, health departments like my own uh, from a national perspective have been underinvested in and that causes some costs on the other end when you have something like a pandemic and need to have the appropriate emergency response, et cetera. But it also has costs when it comes down to people acquiring various chronic diseases and costing the healthcare system so much uh, and wanting to make sure we can intervene on that. So it's, um, it's far greater than investing in the Vermont Department of Health, for instance, and it's much more in the types of programming that will allow our population to be healthier. And really, again, focusing on things that uh, impact health, like how people live day to day in this country, focusing on those social determinants, focusing on poverty, focusing on food insecurity, transportation, that other nations proportionately spend more of their, of their resources on. Um, and then that, of course, then feeds into making sure that the systems are equitable. And if there's one thing the pandemic has demonstrated to us all, um, just using the data, even Vermont data, but certainly national data, is that this pandemic has disproportionately impacted populations of color. Um, that's one example uh, from a long uh, tradition of those populations being adversely impacted uh, under many circumstances. So it's really paying attention to this very global picture I'm trying to paint for you uh, when I talk about the investment in prevention and public health uh, that some nations appear to be doing a lot better in than the United States does. I will add though that uh, Vermont uh, you know, traditionally has focused on all of this, and we have a population who actually wants us to focus on this and adheres to a lot of the uh, guidelines that are going to allow them to invest in their health. And so traditionally we are in those top groupings of states when it comes to what states are healthier than others. So I don't want to uh, understate that. So, so say like here here in the village of North Troy, it could be something as as simple as like uh, you know keeping uh, a, a sidewalk build out. We had a uh, we had um, some sidewalk uh, build outs a while ago, but they seem to have ceased now. Um, that would you know that would allow people to uh, you know to walk safely around the village without being in the road. And uh, you know it it, it would uh, improve public health. So it could be something as simple as is more sidewalks. You're speaking like a true public health aficionado, and that's why we have uh, actually under another executive order that preceded the pandemic from Governor Scott, we have a health and all policies uh, task force that really looks across all sectors of government in the state, so that. It, public health isn't going to be building the sidewalks, but public health is at the same table with ACCD, with the Department of Transportation, and a whole host of other partners in government and outside of government, so that initiatives like you just talked about, which is really what we call the built environment, building a healthier community, which will impact everyone's health, uh, can happen. So thanks for those questions. 
Great, thanks. Um, the governor. Was that um, your Was that your quick name. question for the doctor? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. This, this one's very brief. Uh, in June, uh, you signed, uh, I think it was Act 105 or H947 that, uh, you know, that allowed uh, for, you know, no, uh, or for local officials to uh, set the budgets and stuff. Um, in the village, uh, he, specifically here, we, we have, um, we don't have our annual meeting until you know, well after town meeting. So we didn't get to have a village meeting or, or vote on the budget this year. And absent a vaccine, and if these emergencies continue, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it could be it could be years. I mean, if you look at the story of the, the, the Dodge brothers, say, uh, the 1918 flu took the Dodge brothers out, you know, two years afterwards. Uh, so, or, or, I mean, are we looking at uh, local officials uh, planning a budget with no public input uh, in, into like, you know, a year or two or three? Yeah, I certainly would hope not, <clears throat> Steve. I mean, we've, we've become more interactive, uh, trying to do things uh, remotely, uh, virtually, and uh, I think that's going to continue to be enhanced um, as well, we're just going to have to find ways uh, to accomplish what we need to do to keep government working, uh, which we're, again, challenged with uh, every day uh, as an administration. Uh, legislature is being challenged with that, with this uh, session coming up, and, and individual uh, town government uh, has uh, been challenged. So we'll work our way through this, but um, and, and certainly uh, with the vaccines that are being worked on as we speak, um, and uh, and we hope uh, there'll be some relief over the next uh, um, six months. Uh, then uh, then we'll see a change. But uh, but to answer your question in particular, I don't know if uh, if uh, Secretary French might have any answers to that or or Secretary Curley. Thank you, Governor. Uh, this is Secretary French. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a concern going to the fall of one. Uh, I think we want to talk with the legislature about how, how best to enable uh, voters to participate in that process. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've got a, a massive gymnasium here in the school. Uh, I would think even with a six foot spacing, you know, we should be able, we could be able to accommodate, you know, a village meeting in the gymnasium if, you know, if there were proper sound equipment or something. Uh, I, I think that something like that might be able to uh, give us a workaround at least. You should talk to your local select board about yeah. that. No, oh, we will, I'm sure. <laughs> all right, thanks. Thank thanks. you. Th thank you all very much. Avery Powell, WCAX. <laughs> My question is for Secretary Smith. Um, the Department for Children and Families has told us the, the initial planning stages for the child care hubs are, are going forward, um, including the financial aspects and the location. But with kids going back to school in about two and a half weeks, when will we hear these decisions? Thanks, Avery. Let me give you sort of an update. Uh, DCF has met with uh, community partners to discuss collaboration efforts uh, and have agreed to a uh, public and private partnership. I want to get back to that in just a minute. Uh, DCF has also designated a project manager. They've met internally and with partners to review scope of work required by DCF and community partners and potential sites. They've also been identifying areas for quick successes and potential hurdles with various sites, uh, zoning, licensing, et cetera. Our community partners have created uh, a survey to gather information from prospective hub sites, including location, how many children they could serve, program schedule costs to begin compiling this information in one central uh, location. Let me just say, we, to date, we have identified community partners who will help lead and coordinate the statewide effort to establish these regional hubs. Uh, and I, like I said in last week or this week, uh, whenever I, I announced this, um, this is a private-public partnership. 
Uh, Vermont After School has agreed to be the lead community partner in this endeavor and Let's Grow Kids is helping provide its expertise and assistance as well. Uh, we anticipate a press release will be issued soon naming these partner organizations and providing contact information for programs and businesses that are looking to establish a health uh, a hub site. Let me just tell you what some of the initial feedback that we've gotten uh, as, as we just announced this just days ago. Uh, the initial response has been largely positive. We have strong community organizations stepping up to partner with us. I've named a few with the state. Uh, we have numerous inquiries from businesses, school districts, and other uh, community institutions asking us how they can help stand up care with their regional hubs. Many of the contacts that we've had um, include really creative solutions which speaks to Vermont's ability uh, to program solve uh, when faced with a, a sort of collective challenge. I know um, within hours after um, we made the announcement I started getting e emails about potential sites and have passed them on to DC so I, I would say stay tuned uh, we're getting ready to do a press release and um, it's moving forward I in in, in what I can see in, uh, in in very fast manner uh, follow up about about the hubs and Dr. Levine may be able to chime in about this. When you have um, children coming from different schools potentially all into one place, how is that going to um, help prevent the spread of COVID-19? Well, let me just say we have um, we've had child care centers that have been open throughout the pandemic. Most of those children have been coming from uh, during the height of the pandemic coming from various locations as they uh, came to those child care centers. Uh, probably more, as diverse as we'll see here uh, as well. Um, these hubs will be in regions where, you know, where we've saw, had good experience with this. Since June, we have opened up our whole child care system. And again, we have uh, uh, been fairly successful in, well, fairly, we've been successful in opening up those uh, those facilities. Let me just, before I give it to Dr. Levine, I mean, the regional hubs are required to uh, meet all health and safety requirements to ensure the safety of children in their care outside of the regulated system. The grant agreements that we put together with these regional hubs will stipulate these requirements and regional hubs will have to follow VDH's health guidelines as related to operating a child care system during COVID. Um, they're not going to be exempt from those sort of um, uh, requirements and as we've seen in our system um, since the days that we were at the height of the pandemic and had and never really closed down the child care system and since we sort of reopened after the essential workers program with the child care system after we, we reopened because we kept the infrastructure in place um, by the funding of the infrastructure even though there were no children we've been real successful in bringing in children from all over um, the various locations without instances um, in terms of, uh, of uh, you know, having major outbreaks in a facility. Dr. Levine, you want to? You said it all. Okay. Dr. Levine says I said it all. Okay. Thank you for your time. Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my call. We understand that healthcare centers affiliated with the University of Vermont Medical Center, including the one in our community, are no longer scheduling post-travel COVID tests for the seventh day, seventh day for non-symptomatic essential workers who are returning from out-of-state travel. Rather, they're being told to try and schedule with private providers such as Walgreens or Clear Choice, as well as Porter and Gifford Hospitals. What is the reason for that change? I don't really want to be in the position of speaking for a health care system um, as a spokesperson for the state. But clearly, you know, they're doing what we're uh, 
asking for in some sense because we're asking for multiple aspects of the healthcare system to be partners with the state in trying to achieve the testing that Vermonters want to have. Um, obviously, a healthcare system has many higher priority tests when it comes to people who are symptomatic, people who need to be triaged appropriately within their walls, people who um, might be uh, at higher risk, if you will, in a vulnerable population. So I think that what, that is what you're seeing play out. It doesn't mean they don't care about these people and they don't uh, prioritize them as well, but they hopefully are counting on other parts of their own health care system, like the primary care offices, et cetera, to pick up the slack when it comes to that specific audience of people requesting tests. That's my interpretation. What, what happened was an essential worker traveled out of the state and tried to call the local health care center to schedule a test for the seventh day. This person was non-symptomatic and was told that the UVMC medical network is not scheduling tests for such people, and this is an essential worker. Yeah, and you're, and you're, and you're saying the network meaning even a, even a local office as opposed to the hospital? The local office could not schedule the test for this person. Where okay. previously this person had traveled out of state and the local office had referred, had put in an order for the test and then UVMC, part of UVMC, called to schedule that person's test for the pop-up or for the site that's behind the Burger King in Barry. Yeah, I, I, I don't feel comfortable answering for, for the entire health network. I can only tell you that we're encouraging all layers of the healthcare network to help us in that kind of testing. And that would be an appropriate test uh, to be scheduled by someone at the level of a primary care office. Okay, that leaves this essential worker unable to return to work because the, the person's doctor will not schedule that test. Again, I can't really comment beyond that. Okay, thank you. John Dillon, Vermont Public Radio. Hello? Go ahead, John. Hello. <laughs> um, so the, the legislature is, is coming back, and uh, there was a meeting at the Senate the other day, and they talked about uh, sort of the time frame of, of their work. And it could be um, they're looking at possibly staying in through the 26th of September uh, and looking at a, a number of bills, as you know, including the marijuana uh, tax and regulate, uh, State Act 250 bill, global warming bill that, that Guy Page mentioned. Um, and I'm wondering if you think the legislature should put all its attention on, on COVID-only issues, uh, including your economic recovery plan that you talked about earlier, and, and not this other stuff, and just wait until January. Do you, do you think this should be, is, is your message, or do you want to deliver a message that they should be sort of focused exclusively on, on that issue. Yeah, I, I wouldn't characterize it as focus only on this issue, but I would uh, say that I'd ask them to prioritize uh, the uh, the COVID-related issues that we're facing. Uh, that seems to be, from my perspective, uh, the highest priority. And so I, I would ask them to, or at least the committees of jurisdiction, uh, to focus on, um, for instance, the Economic Recovery uh, Act. But there are other uh, areas that we might uh, need some assistance as well. So prioritizing uh, the coronavirus uh, in this uh, pandemic that we're, we're facing would seem to me, from a common sense standpoint, uh, be an area that should be prioritized, but doesn't mean that they can't take up the other issues. Uh, they're, they're a separate body, um, you know, the third uh, branch of government, and uh, they can do what they want, and, and it's not as though they didn't. They just recessed, uh, so it's an ongoing session, uh, so they can continue to meet. Uh, but uh, but again, they can meet as long as they want. From my perspective, uh, I just want them to uh, to focus and, and pass the legislation uh, to help the vast majority of Vermonters at this point in time, especially with economic relief. Do you, do you see any advantage in tax and regulate 
being done now because of the uh, potential revenues for the state? Well, unless there, I don't know, again, uh, when they would expect uh, to see revenues. Last I heard, it might be a while uh, before um, reaping any of those benefits. But uh, if they could, uh, if we could get uh, money rolling in uh, sooner rather than later, obviously that would be advantageous. But I haven't heard uh, that, that it would be able to be set up um, that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and primary seatbelt enforcement, is that still a non-starter for you? Um, it's something that uh, I have uh, opposed over my years uh, in the legislature, um, that, um, that uh, it's a secondary offense and, and not a primary offense from my perspective. But we'll see what they, what they work through, um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll deal with it as it, uh, as it uh, unfolds. Thanks. A quick question from a listener, if I could, about the uh, grant program for essential workers. And this person's son is a caregiver for a subcontractor of Dale um, and apparently does not qualify for the essential worker grant, even though he's been working directly with, um, with adults uh, with uh, disabilities and, and in wheelchairs, et cetera. So he's been, you know, uh, doing the essential work through the pandemic, but Apparently, is not uh, as a subcontractor available for that grant money. Yeah, Secretary Smith. You know, that's the hey, John, could you have your listener uh, contact me? This is Mike Smith. Could you have uh, your listener contact me? Because there are specifics that I need to know um, uh, in terms of eligibility or non eligibility. I, I'm just not sure, given what you've given me, whether this person qualifies or not. Okay, we'll do. Thanks. Thank you. Eric, Times Argus. Yes, I'm not sure if this is a question for Dr. Levine or Dr. Uh, Secretary French. Uh, with schools reopening next month, do we have any idea what the testing is going to look like, and does the state have the capacity if there's every school is testing its students and teachers? Uh, we'll start with Secretary uh, French. Yes, hi. Uh, currently, our guidance doesn't uh, provide or consider uh, testing all students and teachers. Um, you know, once again, I think due to our uh, high degree of suppression of the virus, um, our protocols are really designed uh, based on that assumption. So that's currently not in our plan. So perhaps Dr. Levine would like to comment further. Well, you stated very well, Secretary French. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that we'll never be testing in schools. That would be on a case-by-case uh, -case basis uh, if that was appropriate for the particular individual. But it's not a criteria for the opening of schools. Have we heard about any schools that are going to be doing any kind of mass testing? Is there any concern about that straining the capability? Uh, this is Secretary French. Uh, I have not heard uh, about schools moving forward with that. Um, you know, that would have to be done in conjunction with Department of Health, but I'm, I'm unaware currently of schools on their own embarking on a testing protocol. As am I unaware of that. Okay, thank you. Joel Baird, Burlington Free Press. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Governor, I'm, I have a question about um, systemic solutions to not only health care, but I guess the economy and any number of things. And I'm asking on the behalf of a colleague uh, to ask someone how they're going to vote in, in the presidential election. Um, but uh, since, since you're a, uh, a public figure, uh, I thought I'd, I'd venture to ask if you have decided in the wake of the Democratic uh, Convention, if you've decided if you're going to cast a vote for uh, Joe Biden. Yeah, uh, as you probably have heard over uh, the last few months or maybe the last uh, couple of years, uh, I, I've been uh, quite uh, adamant in, in not supporting uh, the president. I won't be voting uh, for uh, President Trump. Um, but I have not decided at this point whether to cast a vote uh, for um, a former Vice President Biden, um, but it's something that I would consider. I just haven't made that decision at this point. All right. 
Well, fair enough, and uh, may the best man win. Thank you. Uh, Aaron Patenko, BT Digger. Um, I have a question about the college reopenings and the data that we're going to see out of them. Um, right now, the you know reporting of the number of students or staff members and faculty members at these universities who have tested or tested positive for COVID-19 mm -hmm. seems to be kind of like a patchwork of you know one university has it on their website, one puts it on a press release, things like that. Um, I'd like to know if the state is getting that data from um, all the colleges and if you plan to publish it uh, on a regular basis for the public to see, you know, how the colleges are doing as a whole and if, um, you know, we really will see an increase uh, in cases due to college students. I'll, uh, I'll ask Dr. Levine to answer that, but uh, but I just want to assure Vermonters that uh, any any confirmed cases uh, are reported on our state website. So we, we do uh, keep track of that, but they have to be confirmed uh, in order to be placed in that uh, uh, on the website. And that is absolutely true. And you're right, the colleges are reporting as well um, on their own websites. We uh, have communicated with all the colleges because needless to say, they're not all using the same platforms and the same vendors for uh, getting their test results done. Um, so most of the time we can get an electronic data feed, but not always. So we have to make sure that we get those numbers, not just the positives, but the total number tested as well. Um, I'll have to get back to you on can we actually publish them as a sort of uh, aggregated number. Um, if you know, and that that will depend on our certainty about uh, knowing that we have all of the results in hand that we need, so it's actually a representative number. But I can get back to you on that. Uh, and as a follow-up to that, um, as as you said in the past, you know, out of state visitors in Vermont that test positive while in Vermont are generally referred to the state that they're from to get into their case number. Will that remain true for college students? Yeah. So the college students are basically coming here to participate in their education and stay for semester, two semesters, what have you. Uh, so we covered this at a prior conference. When they test positive in Vermont, uh, they are going to be considered in our numbers. There are some colleges that are testing the students not only when they get here, but actually before they arrive, and using that test to determine if the person gets on the plane or the bus or the car or what have you to get to Vermont. If that test were positive, technically they're still residing in their state and they haven't yet come here to pursue their education. So that result would go to the state that they come from. Okay. Um, so um, how will we know if there is kind of a, a rise in cases Due to college students or do other factors like the reopening of yes. uh, teacher school. Yeah, so obviously every case that's a positive case gets immediately interviewed within a 24 hour period uh, by our contact tracing team. So that will clearly indicate if it's a college case or not. And needless to say, the colleges get their result very quickly because they are the ordering clinician, if you will. So they're usually in contact with us pretty quickly anyways and want to help participate in the contact tracing. So either way, we'll uh, have a good handle on cases that are college cases versus not. Okay, thank you. Derek Brower, seven days. Yeah, uh, 
clarifying questions regarding the quiet health statement for Dr. Levine. Uh, the first is, um, did I hear you say that the FDA has indicated to you that it concurs with the company's review? Yes. All right, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I just gave you a, a yes or no answer. Is that okay? Uh, uh, just yes, okay. So yeah. you have heard from the FDA, okay. The second is, um, can you expand upon the distinction between the, the two reviews? It sounds like here, it, it, I, I understood that the FDA and Quidel seem to be uh, coming at the, at the problem from a different angle than the health department and the CDC. Yeah, so the angle that the FDA and the Kaidel company are coming at it from is really looking at the test as a diagnostic test and was it appropriately uh, performed? Uh, did the site uh, have all the appropriate um, recommendations in place and guidelines in place to perform the test? Um, you know, was the instrument indeed um, giving one the result that one can rely on? So it was purely focused on the test. We as a health department and the CDC are more focusing on epidemiology and how to explain the discordance in what, what we saw as part of what was going on in the region versus uh, what the test results show and the discordance in the PCR tests and the um, antigen tests. Great, thank you. All right, that's the last call. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's the end of the question. Yep. All right, well, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Tuesday.